the hoodie really enters the lexicon of fashion. I mean, we can't sit there and, I mean, we can't go so far back when we discuss hooded tops that we end up in the Middle Ages talking about monks' cows or, you know, with depictions of the Grim Reaper, which I think were like just post-Middle Ages, like 15th century. But I think we want to really locate the originators. And incidentally, this isn't sponsored by Champion. And when we talk about the product is um, we, we estimate the hoodie in fleet, in, you know, the cotton hoodie, as you know it, um, originates around between 1930, 1935. I think that's kind of open to debate. And it's by Champion, which was a sportswear brand, I think started by two brothers from New York called the Fine Bloom Brothers, who then uh, moved to sort of Massachusetts area, Rochester area. And they created a hooded sweatshirt design. Um, the crew neck already existed by that point. If you look at the early 30s and late 20s, it's a real, I think, pivotal moment for the sportswear because in the early 30s, around sort of 1933, 32, like you get Lacoste, Rene Lacoste, and they paint the um, peak cotton polo shirt. Um, and in about, I think around 19, between 1920 and like the late 20s, again, I never know how much of this could be, not to accuse the brands of anything, but rehashed for the purposes of storytelling. We don't know the exact first time a sweatshirt, a cotton sweatshirt became part of that the gear or the rollout. But I know that Benjamin Russell Jr. apparently, according to Law, who's the son of Benjamin Russell, who started Russell Athletic, which is the other big sweatshirt manufacturer. At a time when equipment, you know, gear was predominantly wool, he was a football, I think he played football, um, and he asked for a cotton sweatshirt. Of course, nice convenient story, but it could be true. Um, and so the cotton sweatshirt, as we know it, was born around sort of the 19, around 1920. And then it's like, you think these things seem so obvious, but then it took until the early 30s for a hood to be added. And I think if we look at the example we have here, we haven't got a vintage example, but this is made by um, Real McCoys from Tokyo, who make, who reproduce clothing to the original spec on the original equipment using the same techniques. They're one of a handful of repro brands. Um, there's Buzz Rickson's and there's a brand called The Flathead and they do similar things. And they've reproduced this sweatshirt, which is, looks, I mean, even the branding on it looks a lot like, is, is a real tribute to the champion branding of the time. Um, and it's got this kind of, so this is, this is what a sweatshirt would look like late 30s, 1940s. And it really, in fact, it's, it's super lined. I think the reason it's got this double line in, this is speculation, um, the hooded sweatshirt wasn't a performance object at the time. It was for protection, but I think it was also for wearing when you weren't playing. So if you're just on the sideline or you're sat on the bench, it was made for those purposes, really. Um, so it's double lined. So this thing is insanely thick when you actually handle that sweatshirt. And the hood, I mean, you can see the formula with the double entry pockets pretty much. I mean, it's not changed that much. In a lot of ways, you could just buy a similar design. I think the real key change there, I mean, other than the fit, which I think is a lot slimmer back then, um, is that the hood is just detached. It literally looks like someone sewed a hood onto an existing crew neck and that and sewed the pocket on. I think it's really the origins of the item. But I mean, that was Champion that created that. And they also created a number of other things. I mean, we'll look at another sweatshirt, talk about those. But the thing with, there, were, there was a lot, if you look at it, especially in places like Tokyo, where people really do revere the sweatshirt, I think give it the do it deserves. There's so many different little eccentricities and different examples. There's half zip versions, full zip versions. There's split zip on the hood. There's all kinds of versions. And there's ones with um, contrast cuffs and contrast pockets. I've never known whether that was just a style at the time or it was just because of supplies and the nature of, you know, the economy at the time, post-war, during the war. And you end up, I think at the same time, I think they never patented this to my knowledge. Um, you know, the hooded Parker, I think it was called in some of the catalogs. It just was one of those things, and, and I, there were so many other different brands doing it. Um, Russell, Russell Athletic would create their own one. I mean, I'm looking through, if you look through catalogs from like the 40s and 50s, you can see it's an interesting world because you're looking at sportswear completely unhindered by any notion of it being fashion. It just wasn't a fashion item. It was pure function, and which is also where you end up in this world where people talk about 
I mean, there's pictures of um, workers in factories wearing like hoodies, probably presumably a champion one with that same detached hood. But I don't think it was ever made for workwear purposes. I think that simply coincided that it is quite a good item for that. And obviously, Russell and Champion were making uh, product under military. They had military contracts as well for you know personal training. So you see that it's almost like a it almost touches on workwear and military wear. But I think predominantly you look at it as an athletic object. But I mean, and the fits are very strange around that time too. Like you can see, a Russell bought a company called Southern Southern Athletic. And, you can, and their sweatshirts are built to go over shoulder pads. You know, so presumably, I don't know whether that was for players on the, on the pitch or it was just when they came off or when they were just waiting to go on, they would take these things off. So that was really the origins, I think, of the hoodie. I mean, like I say, so many different elements will be kind of lost in time. And you can see different examples in catalogs. I mean, you've got those double entry pockets there. If you look at a champion catalog from the late 50s, there's five, or no, very early 60s, there's five or six different types of hoodie in there. There's there's a version for um, playing in, you can tell. Um, there's, there's versions called out specifically for like sitting around. And uh, some of them, ones for sort of sitting on the bench and seem to have a different like, um, they have different pocket entries, like they'll mm. have a double pocket system. I don't know whether that was just decorative or it, it had any real purpose. I know uh, Ralph Lauren's like double RL label has made really good replicas of that style as well. It has kind of two pockets to put your hand, you know, has a pocket for each hand. And I think there was also in the early 60s an attempt to try and make rayon hoodies a thing, you know, because the world was going synthetic. But I don't think, I think mercifully it never really caught on. You look at like Take Ivy or one of these seminal sort of books of like people on campus, you know, Ivy League looks, which were a big thing, big inspiration in, in Japan. And there was also like with mod, something they were super interested in as well. But you can see hoodies in there. Um, you can see uh, crew neck sweatshirts being worn for casual purposes. But you don't really see the hoodie other than but he, there's a couple of sightings and it's being used for its true purpose. You know, it's on some kid with shorts who's actually doing some physical activity. So, and, he, and I think, you know, he's in kind of rainy settings. So it's been used as a sort of weather protection. As far as like being early, being a fashion item, I think you have to look through to the 70s, really. I mean, you look at like books on graffiti. I'm not talking like 80s because I know we'll end up talking, you know, there's people who can talk about b-boy b -boy culture and hip-hop culture far better than I ever could but you look at books by there's there's photography by a guy called John Nah who did all the work for Faith in Graffiti which is a book by Norman Mailer one of the earliest books he was one of the earliest champions of graffiti sort of publicly there's another book called Graffiti Kings that came out fairly recently which was actually someone's dissertation I forget the gent's name but you look in those you can see people wearing the hood kids but I think as long as there's been graffiti and as long as people have been doing had access to hooded sweatshirts Anything that's illicit is quite a handy object mm. to have, you know, the nature of that hood. And you can see kids wearing like the hoodie, you know, in those things. But I mean, I don't, I, I couldn't call, the, the 80s really seem to be the point when the hoodie ceases to be an athletic item and becomes this real statement of fashion. I mean, the thing is with a, a hooded sweatshirt, we, you know, we'll talk about it later, but I mean, you have, it. It seems to be associated with lawbreakers. You have to remember, like, it's a college item, you know, college print. It's almost a canvas, literally a canvas to stick something on. You know, Champion were making sweatshirts in the 50s, 60s, and they were to put, you know, they had lettering you could buy for them. You know, they were there just, they, they were a blank canvas. There wasn't any sort of, I don't think, fashion intent. And you think about it, it's supposed to be this kind of lawless, lawbreakers item, but I also associate with kind of gap year girls, you know, kind of college kids, private school kids. And also if you look at vintage stashes from the 70s on the champion side of things, there's endless amounts of like police academies, military academies, navy academies have their own sweatshirts, you know, on a champion blank. So mm. it's a tough one to call. I think it's really, the 80s really brought it in. And I think the key, there's a few moments of like popular culture that made the hooded sweatshirt really pop off. But I think two two moments would be, in 1976, you get the film Marathon Man, which is an amazing thriller, like from that era of really amazing, like William Goldman script. And at the, en and the end of the film, like Dustin Hoffman, the Marathon Man of the title, uh, takes on Lawrence, Liv uh, Lawrence Olivier, and he's wearing like a hooded sweatshirt, a navy hooded sweatshirt. And I think that's on, 
if it's not on the original poster, it's certainly on a lot of the marketing materials. You know, Dustin, at kind of, I guess, the height of his fame with his hoodie on. And also Rocky, you can't discount Rocky. You know, with the Bill Conti music going up the stairs in Philadelphia, it's, that's when you start sort of seeing, you know, it, it's, it's something you could aspire to. It's a kind of pivotal moment of the film. I think it reflects something there. And I, you also get around the same, a few years later, um, I put more, more Paul Gorman's speciality, but he's the one that wrote about it that I found out about from was, you know, Dexys Midnight Runners, who Kevin Rowland is just an amazing chameleon when it comes to style. Um, around 1981, him and the group just started wearing like hooded sweatshirts, you know, they and uh, grey, and then they called it the athletic monk period of their career, which is like, it's this fitness, concept of fitness, purity, you know, real stripped down look. And I think you have to remember, even around that period, I think a hooded sweatshirt was quite an exotic item, you know, over in, the, in this country. While kids would be wearing it for, you know, in New York because it was so easy to find a hooded sweatshirt. I think over in the UK, it was still this object of, you know, exotic, exoticism. It's kind of far, it, it hinted at something else. I mean, the other, I mean, you watch E.T. and Elliot in that film wears a, a zip up red hooded sweatshirt, which for me personally was one of the first times, you know, and he, the film's got that kind of BMX element. And I think the hooded sweatshirt fit into that BMX craze quite well. But I never know, I mean, Spielberg, such a, you know, quite a brilliant filmmaker, but quite heavy handed. So I assume there was some um, fairy tale analogy in Elliot with his little red hoodie on in that film. But I think by that point, you know, it, it, it had started to come over here in a major way. But I mean, if you talk about champion hoodies, if we look at the gray champion hoodie, I mean, this here is not anything special. It's a sort of, it's a recent reissue that feels more like a mixture of 80s and 70s from that brand. Champion for me is the, is the great, is, is the brand which reflects all this so perfectly. And there's so much you can apply to this, you know, from kind of the humble beginnings. There's like two things on this sweatshirt which people don't necessarily, I don't think about too much, is that, that Champion had a they had a they created this see the side there's these ribbed side panels on this item which you take for granted as being an you know on any sweatshirt now or any kind of athletic gear they patented it whether they actually invented it i couldn't really call and they call it's got this really unsexy name i think it's expandable gusset was the name of the technology which just sounds terrible and they also patented a and that was uh, in the early 50s they also patented another technology which is called reverse weave which they use all the way up to the present day which is the weave if you look at one of these sweatshirts i think it goes horizontally and i think that's to prevent shrinkage upwards supposedly they do still shrink upwards but i think it minimizes that i mean champion as a sweatshirt is for, for so many different generations, the definitive object. And somehow they managed to kind of, the C you see on the sleeve there, um, they, add, they added it to their branding, uh, the champion script, I think in the late 60s. Um, but they didn't really add any branding on 20 of their sweatshirts. This is more of a sort of very early 80s introduction to my knowledge. Uh, but this small C is this huge signifier for that brand. It became like a hip hop staple fairly, fairly swiftly, I think it was. And it's also through the hip hop connection has this, a lot of people connect with this item through punk, bizarrely hardcore, because on the East Coast, you had this whole youth crew movement, which was in some ways, it's affiliated with straight edge. It's about, you know, not athleticism. It's a strange clean cut look, but it also has huge b-boy connections you know it has a real influence from hip-hop and the c became this colossal signifier of like of straight edge and a whole way of life on that side of things you can see no end of like album covers by groups like gorilla biscuits you can see like cartoons of apes with the giant c on and it's just unusual they kicked off like that you know bold judge is another group and they would also use collegiate text um, the same way like your gap year girl might be wearing it, they were still using those kinds of things. And there was like Air Jordans, Socanese, and like and a champion sweatshirt sort of took on this other life, which I think is really unusual. And he talked to some guys from, you know, apparently it connected to the casual culture as well. And by the beginning of the 90s, like the champion hoodie became a hip hop staple brand, you know, and that's unusual because this is not a brand that at the time sought out any connection through hip hop. It was not a hip hop line 
it never really acknowledged that hip hop audience uh, beyond perhaps some of the accounts that were stopped in. But the small C really like became like the, you know, the Ralph Lauren pony for a lot of people. The, that youth crew connection still stands to this day. And if you wear like a champion hoodie, people still react. Um, and that goes across. Um, champion has acknowledged that hip hop audience of late. They actually released a hoodie called the Super Hood, which has a hood that is clan-like in its size and they tapped up uh, Ghostface Killer, Jada Kiss, 50 Cent, this is like five years ago, six years ago, to promote that item. It's unusual that that took them that long to acknowledge it. And in a way, sometimes when a brand acknowledges that audience, it almost breaks this sort of, this wall, this, and it feels a bit crass. You know, I, I think it's nicer when a brand just exists through, through reappropriation. I think the quint, one of the quintessential hoodie films is Juice from like t 1992, where you get, you see Tupac back when he was, he didn't necessarily have that thug persona at the time, Tupac Shakur. He was playing a sort of anti-hero turned out and out villain in the film. I think Tupac is wearing a champion hoodie, but the film always distracts me too much to really focus on whether I can see a logo anywhere. But it, when he's at his, his most heinous in the film, for the most part, he's got his hood up, you know? And I think in a weird way that they kind of try to humanize and dehumanize him by putting this hood up. And at the end of the film, not, not to give anything away for anyone that hasn't watched Juice, but you should have watched Juice if you're of a certain age anyway. He ends up hanging from a building in a terribly melodramatic ending, but he's just been had his hood up trying to kill his best friend and then he does the usual cliche of asking for help while he's hanging there and then his hood's down and I kind of felt that even though it's this film that's supposed to be set in a gritty urban setting it's almost like something out of you know like a kind of something far more bombastic like a Master of the Universe adaptation or something it's like Skeletor at the end of the Master of the Universe film or something I think they really play on the idea that when that hood's down he kind of becomes his old self almost I'm not sure if that's our, I mean it's not there's elements of Juice which certainly stand up to analysis, but maybe that theory is complete nonsense. But it is a quintessential hoodie film. This sweatshirt here is called The New York or New Yorker. I heard two different names for it. It's uh, a lent by Mr. Gary Aspden at Adidas, who calls it The New Yorker, so I trust him on that one. We think this is a UK made example, and it has a really interest. It's still, even though this could have just been a cash in into the world of hoodies, you know, and how popular they were at the time, because in the years prior to this, the closest you came was a nylon tracksuit with three stripes on the arm and a hood, which I mean was it was typical kind of you know German pragmatic design process meant that I think they just said, well, you know, it, runners might be out in the rain or cold weather, they need a hood, but nothing more was really added. No, nothing too superfluous. Then. We get to this point where hip hop just hits hard. You know, electro hits hard, BMXing hits hard. There's this kind of casual culture starts kicking in as well. And they all cross over. It's easy to talk about subcultures, easy to start assuming that this happened, then everyone went and did this instead. It doesn't work like that. You know, there's crossover, there's boundaries blurring. You know, casual, like the casual culture up north and I guess across the, entirely across the UK. That is the reason I think people. People look at hip hop being the key instigator for why people wear sportswear as a fashion statement now. And I think casual culture is just as important in terms of just liberating everyone to wear what they want. You have to remember now, we're never with, you know, we're, it's like a Starbucks or a, a, any, or a McDonald's. It's, you're never 10 minutes, you're never more than 10 minutes away from somewhere you could probably buy a hoodie, no matter where you are. It's like the, but, Back in the early 80s, that wasn't the case. It's like, you have to track that thing down a bit. I think around this point in the, in the 80s, it becomes a real statement look, whereas before, very much faded into the background, you know? It wasn't really there to be sort of, uh, to be something to be shouting about too much. It, and you know, the nature of Champion was, it was anonymous. You place your letters onto it, we fade away. And you know, Champion realized whoever was calling the shots, let's put a small signifier on our stuff. And maybe, you know, and that's the point when you start getting Champion logo gear. The other cha Adidas hoodie we've got here is a real masterpiece. It's interesting because like Nike under license was making Windrunners in the UK. I don't know the full provenance of those items, but we couldn't, this country couldn't get enough of the hoodie once it could have the hoodie. Adidas did this hoodie, don't know the actual name of it, but the construction's insane. The way the arms overlap, it almost looks like a tribute to the kind of the cut off sweats you see Rocky wearing in Rocky, you know, as a reference point. And it has these amazing kind of pastel colors 
that feel very of the time and also tap into that kind of terrace look of the time. But it's made in the UK, a company called, a factory called Peter Black, which was up north. They also made clothes for Marks and Spencer. So you can see on the tag, it's made under license. And in this era where we have a single, or maybe a couple of factories in, the, in Asia making products and then supplying, it seems quaint to think that these sportswear brands were just operating with so many different licenses flying all over the place. And yes, this, this, this hoodie here, and it's actually Gary that pointed it out again, so before he calls me out for not giving him credit, there was, it, you can see it in a really excellent book called um, Wild Days by a photographer called Beza, which is in Bristol. People don't realize that in the early 80s, Bristol is just the most well-dressed, kids when it came to b-boying and hip-hop and this kind of nascent hip-hop culture their style is impeccable and you can look in that book you can see people wearing that hoodie and you can also see a really nice crossover which is nelly hooper who went on to be grammy winning producer of so many different people he was he was wild bunch um early massive attack he's wearing like you know this kind of b-boy gear but he's also wearing with those triple tongue sneakers which were from vivian westwood's like witches collection you know, really bringing things together. People think this is a new thing to kind of slum it with, the, you know, with this high and low culture. It just isn't. And that's, again, you talk about revisionist history in terms of these things. And, um, you know, and I think when you look at like some of Westwood stuff around the Buffalo time, um, around the time like they were putting uh, Malcolm McLaren and Buffalo Girls, you look at the catwalk, you can see hoodies entering there. I mean, I actually found an old ad for uh, a hoodie dress for women from the 70s in like Mile Grey. Um, but I think it was more of a novelty item. You know, it was more of a, a onesie of the era. But you look at this top, to me, it really epitomizes that genesis, that, that style that would also go through to the late 80s. You know, baggy, you know, become this thing in the north of England, had the whole country wearing terrible long sleeve t-shirts with hoods in hideous colors. You know, the, it's, the hoodie would just go boom around this time. You can see it, and I think, you look at like graffiti characters, you look at like artwork at the time and the hoodie plays such a prominent role. I think one of the best examples of hoodie being used on an album cover or in an artwork is um, the original artwork for MF Doom's album, which called uh, Operation Doomsday from about 98, which is a real sleeper. He's a real kind of darling now, but at the time it was very much kind of sleeper thing. There's a, the artworks by a guy called Keo, Lord Scotch, and it kind of, it's got Dr. Doom. It's completely copyright flouncing. It's got, it has no, it just completely flouts any rules. And it's got Dr. Doom, but his cape is a hood. It's got the little hood, um, the drawstring elements. And I love that, you know, that to me, it shows us, it depicts the hoodie in a really interesting way. Because I really like the idea of the hoodie as a, a it, it has so many different meanings. And it's also a little bit of personal space. Just from when I used to wear the hood, wear hoodies, it's, it, it was a really nice way to kind of, if I was if I was working and there's disruptions, you can put that thing up and put headphones in, and just zone out. I don't think it's entirely negative, but I guess we'll come to that at the close when we're talking here. But the Nike, Nike hoodie, my personal favourite. This thing's incredible because it's a bit of a Sports Direct classic. Even Nike doesn't really hype up this object too much. Yet it fully represents the brand perfectly for me. It's my favourite piece of Nike contemporary Nike. Um, design the actual swoosh just letting that swoosh float there like they did taking away the Futura lettering I think that they actually introduced this single swoosh in about 1993 I believe it was sort of part of someone changed some court rules and they and they started releasing products with this on um, big giant swooshes on sweatshirts and such like and then they did this hoodie I think it's introduced in the mid 90s I'm sure it's been tweaked a few times since, but I don't think any item, if we're going to go off on the inevitable kind of talk about hoodies in the news, this is the folk demon, I think. This is the folk devil. This is the uniform that frightens people. This is the shopkeeper's worst nightmare for some reason. If we talk hoodies, we can, there's David Cameron's name must be incurred. We, we thought it might be the hoodie that would, the, the child, the kid, the youth wearing, doing gun fingers behind him was wearing in a kind of infamous photo, but that's not the case. We think that's Mackenzie. But this, and then on the David Cameron subject, people tend to, I hate to go on record defending David Cameron in anything, because it's, he's kind of credited with saying hug a hoodie, which he didn't actually do. That was a Labour um, parody of what he had said. You know, it was a rare moment of clarity from uh, David Cameron that, um, or whoever his scriptwriter was, to actually 
I don't know the full words of that speech, but he talked about kids in hood wearing hoodies actually trying to blend in. You know, like they're not. It's almost like a, a, a camouflage. It's just a, a way to keep your head down. It's not necessarily this this menacing statement. This hoodie, I mean, you can get it for thirty five pounds. If it gets damaged, you can get another one. It's fully acceptable. I think as a design, it's actually amazing. I think the swoosh looks so incredible there, the way they put it. And I think. Also, a, two, a, re a really good moment for this sweatshirt, historically, is uh, Roll Deep, When I'm Here video. Especially now everyone's talking about grime. The When I'm Here video um, uses this hood and it shows the entire crew do their verse and pull a hood up and all, and then they're, they're all wearing exactly the same sweatshirt. It's an amazing video, one of my favorite videos of the last 20 years. Most people are wearing it, like I think uh, Trim, I think Scratchy, they're all wearing the sweatshirt with this swoosh. Wiley, for some reason, I think Ever the Contrarian isn't wearing it, which is quite jarring in the video for me. But it really reiterates its role. You watch like all the DVDs, Practice Hours, Risky Roads. It's in there, you know, this sweatshirt's everywhere. I've seen it three times today on the way here. And we're in Knightsbridge right now, you know, that just shows that sprawl. People throw this deplorable term, you know, chav. I think it's bullshit. Like I think it's, it, this is just a very kind of, I think, a very democratic item, which I think at, the, at its best, the hooded sweatshirt is an incredibly democratic item. I think the, there are definitely parallels between the days of, I think the leather jacket, that perfecto style motorcycle jacket ceased to be menacing when Henry Winkler wore it in Happy Days. I think it probably ceased to be menacing a lot. To me, I associate it more with cool kids or you know, I'm not scared of. I guess it's the same way that you think, think certain things were menacing. Once upon a time, seeing knuckle tattoos and neck tattoos, terrifying. You know, if someone, or if someone had a tattoo on their face, trouble coming, not anymore, you know. It's, and the leather jacket is now almost, it's, it's, it's some, your mate's dad after he's been through a divorce. He's just got himself a Mazda as well. You know, it's like, it's changed its meaning, but the hoodie just retains this status. I mean, there was that period between 2003, shops started, you know, that was in the, in the papers, Stop, shops stopped letting kids in wearing hoodies. Which, you know, I, I can understand their side, you know, because if those kids, you can be as liberal as you like. If those kids were stealing things, then maybe you don't want hoodies in there. It's, um, then there was the shopping center situation in 2005, where one of the, one of the largest centers stopped letting kids, people in with hoodies. But there were stories, you know, I don't know whether it was like sensationalism, of people being stopped from coming, people who certainly weren't in any demographic or any profiling on this were being stopped. You know, like someone's dad in his super dry hoodie wasn't getting in. You know, maybe the same dad that had his nervous break, sorry, his midlife crisis, bought his Mazda, you know, he might, in his super dry. It ceased to be that way. I'm, I think the hoodie is true streetwear as well. We, we see the word streetwear used all the time, but most streetwear isn't streetwear. It's not being worn by anything close to the street. It's crescent wear. This Nike hoodie here is true streetwear. It's from a sportswear brand, but it's the real deal. It's, it has, and the other thing with it is, is we can't discount like the kind of the role of the hoodie in streetwear either. I mean, you go back to like sort of I'd seen and skate. Um, it I'd seen it in issues of Thrasher from about 1984 onwards. You start seeing the hoodie become like a real advertised element of that. Um, and then there's other kind of seminal stores. I don't think necessarily get their credit in like pushing this this look over here, which is uh, places like. Uh, Slick Willies, which I think was in Kensington High Street. I think it's also near Hyde Park, which is still, it still exists as a skate shop. American Classics and Covent Garden, I think is such an important shop in terms of like spreading that, that they, this kind of Americanized exotic style over here at the time. And also, I mean, streetwear would pick up on the hoodie, like Bathing Ape, um, Supreme in their early days would print on Champion Blanks, you know, because I think they knew that the Champion the Champion C was a real signifier. I think, some, and we, we now kind of this Q culture, this limited edition culture, is really an established business model over here. But back in 2004, 2005, kids were queuing outside Busy Workshop, which was the Bathe and Ape shop, for these zip up hoodies, which had a full zip all across your entire face. I've tried to look at the actual origins of why that design existed. I know Nike made a version of it. It was like a, a hoodie that went all the way around, which almost like an exaggeration of this panic around the hoodie, you know, as it's, it almost turns into like a balaclava. They made, Bathe and Ape had their version, a full zip, which had kids queuing, sleeping for days outside of like busy workshop. And that was at the height of that kind of, the origins of like real hype culture over here, you know, that I think was big in the Far East at the time. And there was also a brand called LRG. Some people call it an urban wear brand. I don't buy the urban wear term. 
I think it's just a ghettoized way. It's a streetwear brand. And it released a hoodie that zipped up with a kind of skull. It's incredibly like of its time, but Kanye West wore that, I remember. And there was also another hoodie someone sold, which was a, a tribute to the, uh, a takedown of the old CB company goggle jacket you know, around the time of this hoodie fear. So there were these hoodies people could buy, which looked even more terrifying, you know, because they went all the way over the face. They practically created a balaclava effect. I think it's shifting now from sportswear on catwalks. Sometimes I think it was really like, I, th I think there's a few people that do it really, really well. Um, Rick Owens does this really well, because I think there's so many little meanings, you know, you have a, a semi-like -like field day, like looking at like the connections of the hoodie anyway, historically. And he, I think it taps into that kind of monastic, kind of, you know, monk-like look, you know, that we're talking about the middle ages, it taps into um, the hip hop side of things. I mean, some brands have been really flirting with like, you know, maybe borrowing without necessarily giving too much back from uh, black style because I think it's important we do use that term because otherwise I think it's just been, you know, it's taken, it's been borrowed to the point where, you know, it's the same I was saying about urban wear and street wear. I don't really like that different, I, I don't really like to see this differentiation there, but I think a lot of um, black owned streetwear brands like Coke and I is one of the first hoodies I ever coveted in the, you know, one of the first I coveted to that Supreme box logo level of, I just had to have it. And that, that brand's almost, you know, people chuckle about some of these brands, but they're real innovators. But I think Rick Owens, he's definitely on his stripes. I think there's that sense of, you know, you see him, he works out hard. And, uh, you know, I think he's been quite open about, you know, how, how he assists that. But he's a real interesting guy. The way, the way it's that head to toe look, um, you know, I mentioned that Dex's Midnight Runners, that um, period of, you know, this kind of athletic monk look they talk about, or all, all the, you know, youth crew, straight edge there's this sense of health and vitality that i think you know the fitness boom he kind of channels all that in an interesting way and i think if you're going to pay 1395 pounds for a hooded sweatshirt i'd rather it was done by someone who i know could execute a bias cut you know if they have to you know truly understands what they're doing it's not thrown together i think when you buy this a sweatshirt like this um, i couldn't because I think it should be a head to toe commitment to do this, but it looks fantastic. And I think the other element of it is, it doesn't feel like this is an afterthought in the range. It feels like, um, it's not like, I know he's got the dark shadow line, but this doesn't feel like a kind of diffusion. This feels like a genuine element of like his vision, you know, the way they pull things off. So it feels legit. I think there's only a few other kind of, you know, high end designers doing the hoodie right. Uh, my pronunciations are terrible because I spend so much time reading these things. I know like is it Takahiro who does soloist, does amazing, amazing things with like the hooded style, you know, it goes back to this, you know, it's almost like Snufkin from the Moomins or something. It has this kind of real bohemian look, but it's so brilliantly executed. And when you look at those items, there's so much detail has gone into it. So much thought's gone into it. I think um, I really like what Shane Oliver does um, a, a Hood by Air because I think he taps into one thing no one really talks about, which is so brilliant, I think really connects to um, the current sort of zeitgeist in the way that a lot of rappers address him. I think I use the word zeitgeist too much in this talk while I've been talking here, but I keep using it. It's, um, he taps into that banshee boy realness aspect of style, which is that, you know, um, gay, black, um, Latin kids in New York, predominantly, you know, dressing real thugged out. Um, you see, I think there's elements of it when you watch Paris is Burning. I think he taps into that and that's really, you know, he's channeling it in a new way. Mm. I think it's more than just slapping something on a hoodie. There's a, there's, there's a few designers I think really do the hooded look so well. And there's a few mm. that, I don't know, I think, I, I'm always inclined to believe that. Why would I want to buy something from, you know, for X amount of money from, if I could just buy the, the, the Nike sweatshirt from Sports Direct with the swish? You know, what's better? I think it's a tough one to improve on, you know, as a design. But I think if you do the right thing with the elements, um, and I mean with that cashmere sweater, the Rick Owens one, it has these really exaggerated drawstrings. It really, you know, beyond the actual length of it on the sleeves and like the hemline, it does a really interesting thing with, it, it really kind of amplifies some elements, I think, that go all the way back to that first sweatshirt we looked at, you know, the one from the late 30s, and that style, 1940s style. So it kind of brings it full circle, I think. I don't think you can really improve on the formula. It's kind of the Forrest Gump of apparel. It's just been doing its thing, the hoodie. It kind of goes through time and people apply things to it, you know. And I think that's, 
it, it's not unusual that it happened that way, you know. It's, it was always there to be anonymous or to have things put onto it, you know. So, you know, it was meant to have flock lettering, it was meant to have prints on, it was meant to have your team on it, you know. It, was, it wasn't, it was just meant to sort of be there. And I, but so it doesn't surprise me that it sort of sits within so many subcultures like it does. But it's just unusual that such, such sort of basic things should really cause people to just, it, that, that it's so feared. I mean, you, at the moment with the murder of Trayvon Martin, you know, that killing of him is led to it. We, we had this, 10 years ago, we had these protests regarding, um, you know, this fear of the hoodie. And now, I mean, that's turned deadly, you know. Like, it's one thing to be, you know, old-style policemen saying, you can't come here, son, you know, into a shopping centre. It's quite another thing to be killing people under the guise they're that menacing because, you know, young black males because they wear a hoodie. Um, you know, it's a real dark side to this whole thing. And you're seeing these protests, you know, people wearing this, oh, I am Trayvon Martin. You see NBA players doing it. You know, so it's still, you know, I think it's more politically loaded than it's ever been, you know, even more than it was during that, you know, there was a time when th there was that happy slap hysteria around 2004, um, you know, which coincides with like camera phones. Um, and, but, but that was one thing, but now I think it's gone off in this whole different tangent. So, you know, while it's on the catwalk, I think it also, it has, you know, it's a still a very important statement piece, you know, it still has a lot, lot to it. It has many layers.